Now, before we get started, I wanted to um, put out a uh, a notice um, of something on uh, uh, the, the, the White House and the Department of Energy are drafting a national definition of zero energy emissions for part one operations emissions. Uh, and there's been an extension till March 6th, and they wanna hear from you uh, about this. And in fact, following this session at 1.30 e uh, e EST, and we'll wrap up by then, you can head right into a webinar with them as well as another one tomorrow to learn more about this. Now, if you go to our link there, greenhomeinstitute.org, zero emission due March 6, uh, you will also see all of these links and resources. Plus, we want to make sure that residential housing, commercial and multifam multifamily and single family are well represented. And so we have a whole draft of comments in there that you can review and take and hopefully help us make sure that uh, the national definition is incorporating residential housing appropriately. So check that out and uh, learn more uh, on our website. All right, and before we get started, a huge thanks to um, uh, all of our sponsors, especially our top tier sponsors, Mitsubishi and Rheem, who are helping with decarbonization efforts, electrification, and helping achieve many of these uh, green and sustainability efforts. We're really appreciative of their support in being able to do that. All right, so welcome everyone to um, Comparison of Energy Standards Code, uh, Code to Passive House, a report. This course is brought to you by the Green Home Institute. The Green Home Institute is a nonprofit with a mission to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. We are a small but mighty team of three, and I am um, going to be your moderator today. My name is Brett Little. I am the education manager here. Um, this course uh, is approved for multiple continuing education units, including uh, our certified green home professional designations, five pillars of green, AIA health, welfare, and safety may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. Grab that passive house code at the end of this course uh, on your certificate as well once you've completed the um, course. All right, um, so with that, I am super excited to hand it off to our speaker here today, uh, Enrico. I have been following Enrico now on LinkedIn for quite some time and learning a lot, and so I'm really thrilled and honored that he is willing to spend some time with us today talking about this important comparison report and help you ideally make more informed decisions on how to make your projects more sustainable with what you're working on and with your clients. So uh, Enrico, welcome and please take it away. Thank you, Brett. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity of being here and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'm the uh, co-founder and chief product officer of EMU Passive. EMU started off as an architectural practice back home in Italy, and we moved the company to Denver, Colorado around 2016-ish. And because we were having so much issues with implementing passive house in actual builds, we decided to switch um, our company to providing education, mostly for builders. We also found that education is, in my opinion, one of the greater tools we have to uh, make a positive impact on the built environment and, and on our society. So while I miss designing buildings, uh, I'm very happy we did that switch. And today, I believe we are the uh, more prolific provider for hands-on training for passive house builders and architects in the country. And the study today that I'm presenting today came about about two or, three, two or three years ago where we kept on being asked, how does passive house compare to the regular energy code? How does that compare to the California Title 24 or to the Energy Star? So at that time, I didn't know. And so uh, I spent a couple of years developing this research, which is available for free download. Um, and so let me share my screen and let's get started on this journey. So, um, let me see here. It's a comparison of energy standards, code to passive house, a report. So we live in exciting times. Uh, we, this is the age of electrification. Uh, the Biden administration has set some ambitious goals for 2030, including getting 80% of the uh, renewable energy generation, um, getting one every third new car being sold in the US to be electric 
and uh, a four four x increase in sales for residential heat pumps. Those are very ambitious goals. Um, in 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 doing that, we also have some competing priorities that we see in the market as it is evolving. Uh, different sectors, the construction industry as well as the automotive industry, are converging to a single vector that is electricity, which is already more expensive than other uh, more um, carbon intensive energy forms like natural gas, for example. And then in within the green building uh, bubble or uh, sphere, we see competition between operational energy and body carbon, healthy materials. And this is basically there's competing priorities and we're trying to get uh, good information out there to see how this uh, can, can all be worked out together. And lastly, why are we doing, why are we building buildings? This is the architect in, in me asking, are buildings actually getting better with every year that goes by? So ask yourself this. This is a one of my favorite quotes from Rem Collas. He's a, he's a Dutch architect uh, who, who defined people as voluntary prisoners of architecture. There's no law that forces us to stay inside buildings, yet we spend a lot of time in it. Uh, we spend about 90% of our lives indoors. So the impact... Uh, buildings have a very great impact on our health, our well-being. And um, so in, in evaluating building codes, we're going to see also how uh, these building codes can make buildings also healthier. So something that we always ask our builders at the beginning of a course is, how long do you think a, an American family stays in a house once they move, just moved in before they move out again? Take a second to, uh, to answer the question, pop it in the chat if you want. This is something that we ask our builders and architects in the, in the class all the time. And the answers we get range between five to three to seven years. Um, the reality is that the average is 13 years. So a family will in average stay 13 years in a house before they move out again. These are statistics that does not come from passive house, it comes from NHB that traditionally they're not very famous to push code to be to improve and be better. And it has been 13 years for the past 10 years. So if you still hear someone saying that or believing that it is five years or seven, they their frame of reference is off by three times. We are professionals, we are uh asked to provide guidance to our clients. Um, and just having this frame of reference is very important. So 13 years is the average time that, that an American family will stay in one house before they move out again. This is very important. Then in looking at the study, we looked at about a dozen different building standards. Um, some of them are regular energy code, the IECC. Uh, the 2018, 2021, and at the time it was the draft for the 2024 International Energy Conservation Code. Then we had some higher performance, so to speak, uh, building standards, including Energy Star, uh, the DOE Zero Energy Ready Home, and the Pretty Good House that has become very popular on Instagram, for example. And then we looked at some passive standards including um, a, a few from FUSE and, and a few from the International Passive House Institute. And for each, we uh, identified what is the minimum level for a building to comply with that standard. So while your building can be completely off-grid and have zero energy and whatever, for Passive House, we looked at the minimum performance. You know, same with code, the minimum level of compliance for that building to comply with the energy code. And then we had to fill in some gaps we're going to see in a sec. Uh, we're going to compare the performance in both uh, in terms of energy as well as uh, environmental quality. So thermal comfort, indoor air quality, durability, and resilience. So comparison method uh, that we uh, used throughout this study is we evaluated a range of metrics for quality and sustainability, as I mentioned. We used actual projects that we, EMU, modeled over the years. I 
I refer to EMU as a teaching hospital because we mostly provide training for builders um, and architects, but we also have a consulting side of the job, which we keep to keep the, our boots on the ground. We need to see what's going on in actual projects. We need to see how actual products are implemented every day. So for this study, we look at projects from our uh, pool of consulting. Then we kept the uh, pool of projects as consistent as, as possible and had a number of projects that would be high enough to be statistically significant. So we uh, looked at uh, comfort, indoor air quality, durability and resilience, and embodied carbon. Then we developed an analysis using design pH and PHPP, so the, the full passive house um, tools, over 500 PHPP models is what we developed over the last two and a half years throughout this study. We kept the pool of projects consistent by looking at single family homes, new construction. We uh, intentionally excluded commercial projects. We intentionally excluded retrofits because we wanted to have a pool of projects that was consistent. We have 50 individual projects spread uh, from coast to coast pretty much. So a number high enough that would lead us to see patterns and eliminate uh, peculiarities of individual projects. And then we have covered almost all uh, climate zones of the country. So this is the map showing the 50 projects with a breakdown by climate zone that looks like this. And we selected these so that we would have about a quarter of them in hot or warm climate, about a quarter of them in cold climate, and about half of them kind of in a mild climate, so climate zone 405. So these were selected to have kind of a balanced um, spread throughout the country. Then when it, this is some images of the energy models that we developed. Uh, this is a spread looking at the TFA, treated flow area. We try to have the, a range from small ADUs to large projects. So the uh, building size ranges between 500 square feet all the way to almost 6,000 square feet. And we tried to be as consistent as we could, although the priority for the climate was greater than, uh, than this. And um, this is another uh, consideration looking at form factor. There's a lot of information here that I am skipping. I recommend you uh, download the report. It's available for free. Um, so if you're looking at more details, please do and do reach out if you have questions. Then, as I mentioned, we use design pH and PHPP as the design tools because we had the models. These are projects we actually worked on uh, in, in real life. So these were actual projects, unlike um, sometimes when you see some studies over generic boxy houses that are not really real. These were actual projects within a street address where, with a homeowner, with a design team. So these were actually the project. And it, we uh, set up the study using PHP and design PH because we had that resource. That is one of the reasons why we as EMU keep that teaching hospital to develop our curriculum. The Excel format of PHP makes it easy to process data, uh, so which was convenient. And if you're comparing PHPP and Woofy Passive, uh, in their architecture, they're very similar compared to a ResNet software or an Ashley 90.1 software. So um, I don't think that having done this analysis in Woofy Passive would have generated much of a difference. I could expect that difference to be plus or minus 5% possibly, but uh, they are both based on the same ISO standard. So I don't think that change would, would have uh, skew the result differently. Then we kept the modeling as consistently as we can. Please again, uh, download the report to look more at this. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna pick up some speed here. Comparison metric, we looked at thermal comfort, indoor air quality, durability and resilience, operational energy efficiency, and embodied carbon. Uh, the, we're gonna see a summary at the end, which is very complex. It's a very articulate uh, table. So to make it to make this more digestible uh, to a layperson, we also uh, proposed a scoring system, 
which is based on just simple points. We, uh, again, the goal was to simplify the process. We gave 20 points each for each of the value metric. And for each, I'm going to skip forward a little bit. So this is the table of the um, points. You see thermal comfort, in dollar quality, resilience and durability, operational energy reduction, and then body carbon. Each of these value metric got 20 points. And then we broke it down by different criteria. And we're going to see throughout the presentation how we assign those based on the results that we got. So this was a way to kind of compare results from thermal comfort to the operational energy efficiency. You cannot add five extra degrees of comfort to uh, 200 kilowatt hours saved per year. So we had this simplified scoring system as a way to kind of uh, make it more digestible. The building standards that we compared are um, a dozen of them. We're going to see a little bit more of that. Uh, in fact, we started off with the International Energy Code with the 2018, which we used throughout as the baseline. So when we say, hey, this standard provides an X improvement of the energy performance, it is referred to the baseline of the 2018 prescriptive IECC. We looked at the 2021 ICC, and then we also looked at the draft that was circulating last summer for the 2024 ICC. Um, then looking at California Title 24, uh, we set that as the base for the California-based projects, and uh, it, we found some interesting results out of that uh, because California Title 24 is has a name to be a more advanced standard, but we will see with the results how that is actually not necessarily true. Looked at Energy Star version 3.2, looked at uh, the national version. We did not look at state-specific versions in the requirements. We looked at the version two of the DOE Zero Energy Ready Home. We looked at the Pretty Good House as much as we could because Pretty Good House does not really have much in terms of actual definitions of what a Pretty Good House is. So we picked some information from the book, some information from the website, and we kind of uh, pasted together some standardized requirements, so to speak. Again, please look at the uh, download for the uh, standard to look more of these details. Then uh, looking at FIUS, we looked at the uh, 2018 and 2021 performance base, which we, where we use the online calculators to determine the caps for the heating and cooling demand, as well as we also use the FIUS 2021 core prescriptive as one of the standards that we considered. Uh, same for the um, passive house, um, PHI passive house, we looked at both uh, PHI passive house and the PHI low energy building. Uh, for those who are, not, who are not familiar with the low energy building, is a second uh, certification standard offered by PHI for new construction, where the uh, cap for the heating demand and cooling demand is more lenient. So instead of 4.75, it is 9.5. Uh, so it is typically easier to meet. Something I I have not mentioned is that for all of these standards, uh, we assume for all projects to be all electric and to have an air source heat pump to provide heating and cooling and uh, a, a heat pump water heater to provide the domestic hot water. So this we apply to all standards, including the ICC, including Pretty Good House, California Title 24, including FUSE and PHI. That was one of the assumptions that we started off with. What if we go all electric with these projects? What are the uh, energy impacts uh, assuming a, an air source heat pump for heating and cooling, as well as a heat, uh, heat pump water heater for domestic hot water? So this is what you see here. Uh, we calculated the requirements uh, for FIUS uh, 2018 and 2021 performance based and off of the calculators. And these are how they compare to the PHI passive house and PHI low energy building standard. This is uh, assuming 
because Fuse and PHI assume 68 degrees in 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 Tibio in winter time and 77 degrees um, in Tibio cooling temp uh, set point in the summer. So we calculated these, and then all of the modeling we did was based on the assumption that the heating season would have 70 degrees indoors, and the cooling season, we would have 74 degrees indoors. Those we deem to be more representative of how um, Americans run their homes. So that is what we get uh, for, for all building standards, including PHI and fuse. Um, then a note that if you pursue certification with the EPA in dollar plus, which is required by FUSE and DOE, you are required to do the energy star. If you're looking for the DOE zero energy ready home, you are required to do the EPA in dollar plus, and that triggers you to uh, certify with energy star. If you're looking at fuel certification, then you need to do the EPA in dollar plus. You need to do the energy star and you need to do the DOE zero energy ready. Something to keep in mind if they're looking at these programs. Then uh, looking at metrics for building quality. Again, we spend 90% of our time inside homes. So we try to look at how good these prisons, <laughs> voluntary prisons could be for occupants. Starting off with thermal comfort, this is something that we calculated in PHPP starting from the uh, U factors that each standard requires for, um, for it to be used. Some assumptions here, and um, this is the some of the results. You see a threshold orange line. Um, sorry, taking a step back. At the bottom along the X axis, you see the exterior temperatures ranging from 45 degrees all the way down to negative 25. These are the uh, exterior temperature for each of the project uh, for the design of thermal comfort and the selection of windows and doors. That is the average of the coldest consecutive 12 hours of the year. So we had some project in milder climate zones. You see there's a cluster of them with a, a, an average temperature of 40 degrees. And we had a lot colder climates all the way down to the exterior temperature being around negative 25. Again, this is the, the uh, average of the consecutive 12 coldest hours of the year. You see that if you're using a code minimum uh, window package, which is the uh, white bubbles with the black, with the gray uh, outline, uh, that is the code minimum, you, you, you frequently are in the zone of thermal discomfort. Similar for the uh, Pretty Good House, they have some very uh, generic requirements for an R5 windows all the way up in climate zone six which does not really uh, address the issue with thermal comfort analytically. So that is why you see the grayish green uh, bubbles being in the zone of thermal discomfort. And then at the top, you see the blue and orange, uh, uh, blue is fuse and uh, orange is PHI, which is uh, there around the threshold or above the threshold for thermal comfort. That is how, uh, about typically uh, mandates uh, selecting windows and doors. So we looked at this as one of the parameters to determine thermal comfort. In these are the averages. You see the uh, average delta um, on the left hand side. If you have an, a code compliance uh, building, your average window is in average uh, about 14 degrees colder than your room. The exception is for California Tata 24. It looks very good because the delta is only 8.6, but that's because it's California. So the temperature is not, is not very cold. You know, actually the, the requirements of the California Tata 24 are, are pretty low and pretty relaxed with regard to thermal comfort. And then you, on the right-hand side, you see PHIs and fuse um, average um, temperatures, which are around the... Uh, zone of thermal comfort. So looking at thermal comfort, we also factored in um, reduction of air leakage, which is we're, we're going to address in more detail later, but this is, it was accounted for here too. We see a range here um, 
let me see a little bit, you see a range here of temperature and, the, and results uh, between the different standards we had considered. Now switching to the indoor air quality, we started looking at how much airflow each building standard requires. Something to say about the IECC, the regular energy code, we assume continuous ventilation. And that is very generous with regards to uh, the regular building code. And even with those parameters, the regular building code still does not really meet high uh, indoor air quality levels. Uh, we use a, a European standard to assess the um, CO2 level. This is, again, this is one of the, uh, the factors we accounted for in the indoor air quality analysis. Um, and looking at the compressed results, you see that uh, the IRC, uh, even with the requirements for regular code to have continuous ventilation, that results typically over the 50 projects that we uh, considered in 12.4 cubic feet per minute per person, which is uh, too low. Uh, whereas the high, higher performance standards that we looked at, uh, in, including uh, fuse and PHI are in the 20 to 27, so much higher airflow rates. Uh, California 24 um, Energy Star and DOE follow ASHRAE 62.2. California 24 does a better job at requiring air filtration, as we're going to see later, compared to the Energy Star and the DOE standards. Uh, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, this is a list of each standard that we considered and uh, what kind of filters they require. Starting off with the IECC at the top, 2018, 2021, and 2024, no real requirements for air filtration. California Title 24 has a pretty stringent air filtration requirement with MERV 13. And you see that a MERV 13 filter blocks off uh, about 50% of the 0.3 to 1 micron particles, about 85% of the 1 to 3 microns, which is the, that is the important stuff because that is the particular method 2.5, which is, uh, uh, it causes cancer and the MERV 13 blocks off 85% of that. And then the grosser, larger particles, that same MERV 13 blocks off 90%. Now, if you go one step below, you see the energy star has a much more relaxed requirement for, for filtration, MERV 6, which only uh, filters out about a third of the larger particles. Uh, the DOE zero energy, energy ready blocks off about 20% of the particular method 2.5 because they require a MERV 8 and so does FUSE. So if you're looking at uh, which standard require, had, uh, requires better filtration, you know, California uh, Title 24 is up there as PHI is. Uh, we have some middle ground with FUSE and the DOE zero energy ready and uh, the co code minimum, so the uh, IECC or the International Residential Code does not really address that. Um, this is a, just a picture to show a, a new MER13 compared to a, a MER13 that has been used for uh, three months. And that's something that is very important if you're trying to deliver indoor air quality. Now, on the same bucket of the indoor air quality, we also included the air tightness of the building because one, Part of that is to keep the pollution out. Uh, this is a study from Australia where they monitored a passive house in a regular building during a, uh, an event of wildfire. And they confirmed that the more airtight the building is, the more it's easy, the easier it is to keep the pollutants out. And then the one entry point for the smoke to come in or pollutants to come in is the ERV and that you can filter. So you have control over that. As well as there's some anecdotal uh, experience from a big wildfire we had in Colorado a couple of years ago. If you go to the Passive House Accelerator, you will find an interview with Mark Attard. Uh, Mark lives in a house that is not a certified Passive House, but he spent a lot of time air sealing it very well. And so when the, the whole neighborhood was... Uh, uh, under smoke, mostly, um, during this wildfire, 
a lot of the houses got smoke damage and uh, his neighbors had to spend a lot of time out and away from home. They could move in the next week. Uh, so that is one advantage of building airtight. Then uh, another aspect that we put in in this research is the, uh, how the standards address avoidance of modern condensation. Uh, this is one side is prevention of interstitial condensation. So in condensation that happens inside your walls and all building standards that we considered address that in one way or another. And that is not what we're talking about with these pictures. This photo shows surface mold and condensation. And that is something that is a step up from the interstitial condensation. It, um, it's a combination of thermal bridge avoidance and proper ventilation. Uh, PHI has a very thorough uh, method with that, uh, following ISO standard 13,788. Uh, uh, Fuse addressed it partially, uh, be, and I'm saying partially because they also allow to use um, NFRC and uh, AMA um, product accreditations, which are not designed to do this. Again, if you want to look at more specifics, look at the report, there's a whole section about this. Um, and then no other building standards other than PHI and FUSE will address this. Um, so this is something that is very important the more we start building airtight if you want to keep uh, high indoor quality inside our buildings. Then uh, one thing that uh, some of the standards do require is a certification via the EPA Indoor Plus program, which I actually found uh, very interesting and I'm, I'm considering doing this for my own house. It addresses moisture control to some degree, uh, radon, uh, pest, and the HVAC system, as well as combustion pollutants and some finishes. Uh, so this is something that um, some standards that, um, that require include the DOE Zero Energy Ready Home as well as fuse. So we gave uh, points in the, in the scoring system to these standards because they do require this. Now, I don't have direct experience using this program yet. Uh, so I don't know how good this actually is in improving the indoor quality, or as opposed to just being some extra paperwork. Uh, I'll be using this for my own house project in, in the next couple of years. So uh, I'll be able to provide better feedback later. So looking at the scoring for the indoor quality, we talked about the bulk fresh air provided, the reduction of air leakage, the minimum air filtration required, the avoidance of mold and surface condensation, as well as the EPA indoor plus. Uh, we talked about this, so I want to get a little bit faster than that. And this is the scoring system that we looked at um, for this section. Then uh, the air leakage reduction, how we measure that, um, most of the standards that we consider use the volu volume specific requirement. Uh, that is, they set an ACH requirement, whereas FUSE uses an, a surface area specific set of requirements. Uh, a note to this is that uh, PHI has some additional surface related requirements for very large buildings. And uh, California Title 24 has zero requirements. <laughs> it's to me, when I found that out, I'm like, mm, we, need, we need some work here. And I can expand on that um, later. Um, so for, in this analysis, we actually used a, an, an assumed ACH 50 of 4.4 for all of uh, California Title 24 projects, more because that is how the software is set up. Uh, but there's no actual requirement for you to meet in California. Now, looking at all of these projects, we calculated, we listed the uh, ACH 50 requirements for those standards that set ACH 50 requirements. And for fields, we calculated that backward. And then we looked at the uh, averages. We're going to see that in just a sec. And then the, for the surface related metric, we did the opposite, where for fields, we had the surface related caps for that air leakage. And for the other standards, we calculated backward to see where we, we would land. 
same, same. And the comparison is actually pretty interesting because you, once you convert the surface related requirements to the ACH50 and vice versa, this is the results that we got to. This is again, an average over 50 projects. This is why we wanted to have a number of projects large enough uh, to be statistically relevant. This is single family homes. It is not commercial projects. So that the size range is what we saw between 500 square feet all the way to 6,000. But in average, you can see that, you know, California Title 24 is up to the roof. They're doing their own thing. Um, energy star is around two, the, um, sorry, energy star is around three. ACH 50, DOE zero energy already has different requirements depending on climate zone. The average for these projects is around two ACH 50. Pretty good house um, and low energy building, uh, PHI low energy building set it at one ACH 50. And then for FIUS 2018 and 2021 performance based, the resulting average is about 1.1 ACH 50. So higher than Pretty Good House and the uh, PHI Low Energy Building, and of course, higher than uh, PHI Passive House because that is set at 0.6. To be noticed that um, the requirements for the air tightness for the fuse prescriptive, is it is more stringent than the um, performance-based approach in fuse. And on the right-hand side, you see the same results converted to the surface-related uh, air leakage. Uh, which is pretty much the same, just looking at the different metric. Uh, looking at this, if you have more, want to see more details, again, you can look at the um, um, full result. Something here that I'm probably going to skip over a little bit. I, uh, we see anecdotally that a passive house building is a lot more resilient than a code minimum built. The bottom side of this slide is the ice box challenge that uh, PHN Passive House Network organized last year downtown Denver to compare a Passive House built house to a code minimum built house and see how much they could keep ice during the summer. Um, and passive, the Passive House one, of course, won because it, it had half the losses of ice over a week of time. On the part above in the slide, it is uh, a picture from our EMU's um, training, where at the end of the training, we have builders and uh, other people that come take the workshop, assemble these pods that are built to the passive house standard. Then we heat them up and we unplug them, roll them outside, let them cool down overnight. And the ones that stay warm the longest wins. That is whichever it is the most resilient. Uh, so we try to convert this to a definition. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on the details. Uh, you see that this is related to the total heating load. Again, there's more details on this on the report. Um, what is interesting is that if you look at the left-hand side most graph, you see the in the white column, the 2018 uh, energy code with 11.7 inclusive R value, whatever that is. I don't want to get into that today. But if you go to the 2021 and 2024, the improvements are minimal. So the energy code is making very, 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 very small steps towards making buildings better. And if you look at that resilience uh, indicator, PHI passive house is the one that performs the most with about three times more inclusive R value than the 2018 code. Um, so looking at the score for resilience and durability, we looked at air leakage reduction, avoidance of interstitial and avoid condensation and avoidance of surface condensation and thermal resiliency. Uh, this is the scoring that we're getting to. Um, so this gives you an idea about who uh, allows to build, which standard allows to build a more durable and resilient uh, building. Then finally, we get into the energy and carbon. Um, starting off with uh, giving a harder time still to the energy code. We compared the 2021 ICC to the draft of the 2024 ICC. And we what we found is that over the 50 projects that, that we modeled, the difference between the 2021 energy code and the 2024 energy code is about zero. I'm going to repeat that. 
the 2024 energy code will produce a change in, compared to the, the compared to the 2024 sorry 2024 compared to the 2021 the change in improvement is about zero it's actually about one percent worse so this is where the in my opinion the energy the ICC is making itself irrelevant in a way because it's re really not pushing for change I was kind of shocked but also not really uh, looking at the breakdown of heat losses, this is something that we teach um, builders. And you know, if you go on YouTube, if you go on Instagram, there's all this talk about air leaks and air sealing, which is great. But if you look at the actual data, then the data tells a different story. This is the average of all 50 projects modeled with the 2021 IECC. And you see that more than one third of all of the heat losses come through the windows. Second on that list is exterior walls. Again, these are actual projects over 50 different locations with their own geometry, design, orientation, neighbors, blah, blah, blah. So number one is windows. Number two is exterior walls. Number three is losses through the ground to the outside. I'm gonna say it again. Heat losses to the ground, to the outside, matter more, in average, than the air leaks, which comes forth in this analysis. Again, please look at the data, uh, because otherwise we don't make really informed decisions. What I found interesting is that once we turn on the passive hours on these projects, the breakdown is actually pretty similar. Uh, this is looking at the same project uh, in the PHI passive hours version, Again, one third of all of the losses are through the windows, even if we have brilliant triple pane windows and whatnot. Second one is again, losses through the exterior walls. Third is again, losses through the ground to the outside air. And then uh, actually for the uh, for passive house, the roof is actually more important than the air leaks. What is interesting is that this is the two absolute values compared to one another. So passive house has a lot more, a lot less heat losses, but the breakdown is pretty similar. So windows are a huge part of that. Um, now, now we are switching to talking more about uh, the environmental impact of using energy and something that, uh, you know, so far we have used the, the, the definition of the DOE, what uh, in a zero energy building is. This is a pretty old document. Last year, uh, Ashra actually published a new standard um, that defines uh, zero energy and zero carbon buildings. And what is interesting is that with this new definition, EV charging, so the charging of electric vehicles does fall uh, within what the building has to compensate to be called net zero. Whereas in the older definition of uh, the DOE, that was excluded. So a pretty big change if you think of, you know, 10 years from now, we're going to have a lot more electric cars. And the uh, the goals, uh, the, one of the goals that the Biden administration has set for 2030 is for every third vehicle sold in the country to be electric. If you try to see how much extra work that is in terms of offsetting that energy, it's a lot. We're going to see just that. So looking at the heating demand, look at the beautiful graph that they <laughs> created on the left-hand side. We are looking at the heating demand and cooling demand that is only driven by the quality of the building envelope. This is just a building envelope, no mechanicals yet. And then we are going to add a air source heat pump for each of these um, projects and each of these building standards. And we used... Um, requirements that each of these standards set for that air source heat pump. And if those uh, business standards don't set a requirement, then we use a basic heat pump that is less performing than the others. You know, that is how we are, are going to get to the site energy for heated and cooling in this research. So um, this also leads us to a, a discussion about what are heat pumps good to do? The two columns on the left here, the orange one shows the uh, HSPF, uh, heating seasonal performance factor for an air source heat pump. 
Uh, so for one kilowatt hour of energy, it produces about 8.8 .8, uh, kilobit use of heating. Whereas the same heat pump in cooling mode produces 15 kilobit use of cooling. So heat pumps are uh, more efficient in producing cooling. This is something that is very important because if the mechanical system is better at producing cooling, then the envelope has to be better at producing heating. So at conserving the heating. So it has to be better insulated. The two graphs, one in the middle and the one on the right-hand side here, compare the 2024 energy code to PHI passive hours. The one in the middle is for heating and the one on the right-hand side is for cooling. In the first place, you see that the, all columns on the, in the center graph are taller than the ones on the right-hand side. So the heating for, even for the projects in, in warmer climate, there was a lot of heating that these projects need. Um, and the heat pumps uh, are less efficient in producing heating. So that is where having a more efficient building envelope becomes more important. Furthermore, um, if you're trying to offset energy, um, cooling, the heat pump will run during the, the day at the same time as your PV system is producing energy. Whereas for heating, most of the heating happens at night where your PV system is not really generating much, you know, or none at all. So that is where your heat pump takes energy from the grid and the grid is still pretty carbon intensive. The, so just keeping forward a little bit, Looking at the reduction for site energy combined for heating and cooling, uh, for warm climates, this is again, uh, compared to the 2018 baseline, uh, we have these three charts. Um, I'm gonna look at the average in the next slide. Uh, so the averages are for the reduction of site energy for heating and cooling compared to the 2018 IECC. The 2021 IECC, reduces that by about 9%. The 2024 ICC is a little bit less, 9.2 versus 9.4. California Title 24 is actually uh, only 4% better than the 2018 code. Um, we're gonna see that one of the big advantages or pros of California Title 24 is that they mandate PVs. So they, they have a different strategy. They are more focused on compensation. Then energy star is about 20%. DOE zero energy rate is about 25%. Pretty good house is about 40%. And then we have the FUSE 2021 prescriptive, FUSE 2018, FUSE 2021, and PHI low energy building in the 50 to 55%. And then PHI passive hours reduced the need for heating and cooling by about 70% in average compared to the, compared to the 2018 code. Uh, compared to the, uh, this is actually this one on the right hand side, uh, it, it's fair to say that compared to a PHI passive house, for example, a 2018 um, or any any code built building requires about four to five times more energy for heating and cooling. And for the, um, compared in comparing PHI and fuse, you know, fuels and PHI low energy building are, are between one and a half to two times more energy for heating and cooling compared to PHI passive hours. So looking at the source energy, um, we have here the breakdown for heating, cooling, domestic hot water, appliances, and PV production. You see that the only standard that actually mandates using PVs is the California Title 24. Then what happens when we start charging vehicles? How does this, you know, crazy guy trying to sell us uh, Teslas come into play? We just saw that the new definition of net zero actually covers charging EVs at home. So if we add charging two electric vehicles at home in average, this is what it looks like. So it's a lot. <laughs> I was shocked uh, by how much, but it is. They're very energy intensive. The good news is that if you switch to passive house, uh, you can maintain a similar energy consumption uh, uh, to a regular built house, but you can also charge two electric vehicles. Or to rephrase that, it takes about the same amount of energy 
to run a code minimum build house without any EV charging, or for about the same amount of energy, to have a passive house and charge about two electric vehicles at home. Clearly, this is also climate specific. In California, because we have less heating and cooling, that equation is not to two electric vehicle charging, it is to one electric vehicle charging. But this shows how important the it, 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 how important this efficiency of buildings is in the context of everybody's moving towards electrification and now electricity is contended between the construction industry, the automotive industry and other industries. So this shows the importance of building better buildings even in the age of heat pumps and PVs. So uh, looking at the score a little bit quickly, quickly here, I want to get to the uh, carbon reduction here. You see kind of the performance level and something that we accounted for here because it's a scoring system is measurement and verification. It's, it's easy to promise that your building is going to be more efficient by X, but if you don't have a way to establish an expectation, so if you don't have as a requirement some energy modeling to determine how much more efficient your building is, then uh, it's ha it's, you're not setting a, an expectation, you're not setting a, a goal, and you cannot meet a goal that you don't that you don't set. So the, in this in allowing this score uh, scoring points, uh, we did not we only provide extra points to those standards that require some energy modeling, whichever the type. Looking at the body carbon, which is very important, uh, there are different ways to uh, integrate the embodied carbon analysis in our projects. We have two here, pH ribbon and uh, beam. For my home personal uh, project, I'm using beam in, in, on my weekend, so I don't have really have much time for it. But the reality is that none of these uh, building standards really require that. So at this time, at this time, the at the time the report was generated, none of the building standard that we um, reviewed had some targeted, clear, specific requirements for reduction of embodied carbon. So for that, all the standards got zero points. What we found interesting is that uh, we the concept of resource efficiency. So we looked at uh, comparing a performance-based approach and a prescriptive approach, which we select a project where that performance com comes close to each other. We looked at the PHI low energy building as the performance-based and the fuse prescriptive as the prescriptive standard. And of all of these projects, we selected the ones that come within 20% of one another, uh, just to see, okay, you have two options to get to the same energy performance, and then which one is the most cost effective and most resource effective. And what we found is that to get to the same energy performance, the performance-based approach, uh, approach allowed to save in average about 800 cubic feet of insulation to get to the same performance. And in average, accounting for the cost of the energy modeling, you will still save about five grand per project uh, because you are saving so much energy, because a prescriptive approach, whichever it is, is an approach where you have the answers before you ask the questions. You, whoever set up the energy code or the prescriptive requirements, uh, they don't know what your project is like. They don't know your orientation, your form factor, all of the parameters. So it's kind of like hoping that you're going to get an, a right answer. But what we found in this analysis over about 20 projects within the uh, within the 50 uh, is that you save, if you save 800 cubic feet of insulation, you save a lot of carbon, no matter what insulation you use. It's a, and it's, you also save a, thousands of dollars of energy, of, of upfront cost. So that is something, one of the most important findings in our study. Uh, so for the embodied carbon, as I mentioned, we had no requirements for any of these standards for the embodied carbon reduction, so none of them scored any points. And for the resource efficiency, we gave points to those standards that require um, energy modeling, because that is a way to be aware uh, of what you're doing. You know, 
So whichever the goal, we are accredited points to the, to the performance-based uh, standards. So skipping ahead a little bit, I would like to get to the discussion. So conclusions, um, the goal of this study was to compare different building standards and determine their ability to deliver value to building occupants. For the metric consider, uh, considered, regular building code resulted insufficient in delivering high quality built environments for human occupancy. That is true for thermal comfort, uh, more than condensation avoidance, indoor air quality, and pretty much any parameters for indoor air quality we've, we've uh, looked at. And sadly, the draft of, of the upcoming 2024 update resulted to be in, unable to improve on this issue. So code is stuck and it's not really making progress. Passive building standards to a different degree each outperform all of other building standards in terms of comfort, indoor air quality, durability, and operational energy efficiency. Then the performance-based passive building standards showed great potential to become a major strategy in avoiding a significant increase in the electric infrastructure once electric vehicles are widely adopted. And then none of the building standards investigated currently uh, currently address embodied carbon in a structural and intentional fashion, but the results, uh, the resource efficiency analysis demonstrated how the performance-based approaches are able to pay themselves back. Like we talked about $5,000 net of the extra cost of uh, the energy monitoring. And so the offset, the energy analysis uh, fees uh, in savings for other, for other building components, specifically um, the energy, uh, the insulation. That being said, this is the big complex summary. Uh, if you want to look at more details and more conditions that we assumed in the study, please download the report. It's available for free online. And for scoring, this is what it looks like uh, overall. So we had 100 point total. None of the standards got 100 points, but this, this kind of helps you uh, navigate these results in a more simplified way. That being said, I thank you all for uh, your attention. You can contact me anytime at this email address. You have the link for the uh, download of the report. You can, if you, you, we are also on YouTube. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, details and analysis on our projects. So that is, I'm always excited to publish new stuff every time. And if you're interested to learn more, uh, please check out our training page on emupassive.com slash training. Uh, thank you all for your attention and we can dive into some questions now. Hey, uh, Miguel, thank you so much. And um, we're going to go ahead and get to those questions real quick before we do. As a reminder, um, if you want to rewatch this session, share it with friends or colleagues, post it on social media, head over to our YouTube channel. Uh, uh, and you'll get it in the next couple of days there, or you can subscribe now and get an instant update when it's available. For those of you watching this in the future, not right now, but on demand, please take the quiz with an 80% passing rate to receive your continuing ed certificate. For those of you watching this right now, um, uh, as long as you've been appropriately here for the entire CU hour and logged in, you can head over to certs at gutenbergcerts.com and you can receive your certificate. Uh, sorry, that'll be sent to you from that email. So check your spam. Um, we're gonna get into Q&A. So if you've been here, you can go, but we hope you'll stay. There's a lot of great conversations and questions to be had. And finally, we're uh, super thankful to our board of directors, our volunteers, our executive director, Jose Reyna, and all of our sponsors who are helping us decarbonize and meet these standards, especially Mitsubishi and Rheem for all electric heat pump technology to achieve these goals and results. So, um, and we go, there is a lot of great questions and thoughts here in conversation. I'm even trying to figure out um, which one to get to. I guess the first kind of thought um, I wanna put out there is, are you doing multifamily and, uh, maybe as the next phase and how could someone take away anything from this in the multifamily sector, if at all, maybe not? So that's a great question. Uh, there is a um, there is a study being worked on by um, RDH, I believe, Stephen Winters Associates, PHN. So there is a, a parallel study group working on uh, multifamily. We we do some multifamily, but smaller scale. And so that's really not our focus at the moment. 
Okay, fair enough. Um, the other question was about um, comparisons with some of the other uh, green building programs out there and if that was in a consideration. So you have Pretty Good House, uh, which isn't a program, isn't a certification. It's just a list of suggestions, right? And mm -hmm. uh, it's a great list. Um, but you also have your big programs, Lead for Homes, National Green Building Standard, Green Star, the Living Building Challenge, which has a zero energy mandate, right? And yeah. so the question I want to ask is, was that can considered? And then I kind of have a follow up to that. So, yes. So great question. And um, at some point, I had to draw a line. Yeah. Um, and that's as simply as I can put. We, we don't have much experience with lead homes. I we did a lead project for the multifamily in 2009, but that's about mm -hmm. it. And we never did anything after that. Yeah. The living building challenge, that's something that uh, I found, I find off putting that you have to buy their standard. At uh -huh. least last time I looked into that. And so I didn't. Okay. Uh, so if anyone is listening from living uh, building challenge, make your standards available for free. Um, that's about it. Does that answer oh. your question? Well, and and so I, I bring up the green building programs in the sense is that you, you brought up this fascinating point that I want to hit on is that a uh, passive house meets a code home in energy usage when you tack on those two EVs, right? Those mm -hmm. two electric cars, right? It's kind of the, the gist you made. Now you made some clarifications for climate zones and all that. But mm -hmm. the green programs, especially LEED, for example, have location and transportation. They have points and encouragements for getting rid of vehicles entirely and having, mm -hmm. you know, connected cities. And so I'm curious where that comes into play about building in cities where you maybe don't, you can use alternative transportation, walk, bike, you know, yeah. how, how does that come into play? It, it's perfectly fair. And something that I should have opened with is uh, Passive House addresses the building envelope very well and other things does not. Mm -hmm. uh, one clear example of that is the Embody Carbon. The PH Ribbon is something that was developed in the UK as a plugin. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, I I know PHI better than I know Fuse, like personally. Um, and I know that they want, when they do something, they want to do something very well. Mm -hmm. And they are happy to delegate substantial parts of the research to other institutes and other goals. You know, so Passive House addresses, like, addresses the knee on the personal health. It does not address the whole body. Um, and that is what... Lead started off with is a more environmental uh, sustainability, which is mm -hmm. important. Uh, it's just uh, limited. Yeah. So, plus, sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's that's yeah. Thanks for for sharing that. So, um, uh, a, a specific question here, and I'm not sure if PHPP considers um, passive solar to what extent, but the question is. Did you take into account solar gain through windows, especially oh, yes. south facing to offset the heat loss, especially for south windows that were properly shaded for direct yes. summer gain? Yeah, so this was all based on full on 3D modeling of the building in, in okay. its surrounding, which accounts mm -hmm. for the balance between heating and uh, sorry, losses and gains to the windows. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that graph, uh, looking at the windows did not account for the passive solar gains. It mm -hmm. was just looking at the conduction losses, but this is a full-on uh, PSVP energy modeling. And and Passive House does use a lot of the passive solar strategies. Uh, mm -hmm. It is just a lot more evolved compared to the mm -hmm. old passive solar. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe there's keeping on the windows more information in the report, but there was someone mentioned that it seemed like thermal comfort was simplified here. Mm -hmm. Um uh, and so they were asking, wouldn't the size of the windows affect whether or not the occupants would actually experience thermal comfort? It does. It does. And also the location of the window does. Mm -hmm. uh, that was built in into the model because mm -hmm. each each building was an actual uh, model where, where we had four windows that were floor to ceiling versus windows that were different shape and size. So that was kind of the average of them all. In an actual project, you will need to review them individually. Here, mm -hmm. we looked at more of the average of what the, what the standard requires and what the results were in specific locations and, and those specific projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
the other question uh, that I had, was, so indoor air quality. So you, so the indoor air plus program and passive house, of course, in many ways has somewhat slightly performance prescript prescriptive based indoor air quality, some performance with ventilation standards mm -hmm. and air filtration. But was there any actual measurements of IAQ, you know, IAQ sensors? Was that considered? Is that on your list to do? Um, that's a great question. Uh, well, I've been incrementally depressed about my own house because I, because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I, because yeah. I, I live in a house that was built less than years ago. We are designing a, a beautiful passive house in the mountains, but the reality is that we are in a cold minimum build house. Right. And CO two is through the roof, particular metal is through the roof. For Radon, I spent the last few weekends air sealing my crawl space, so that mm. is proof that you know code is not working. Mm -hmm. uh, we have mm. data from some possible projects we have worked on. We have a project for to monitor indoor air quality that start the, the project originated before COVID. Mm -hmm. And then I had to put it on pause. And then we got a kid. So like we have a project to monitor uh, about a dozen possible projects. It is about finding the time to do so. But it is mm -hmm. next. It is on my agenda. Maybe we'll... Uh... Have you back out for that one then when you get those studies in? So, yeah. 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 Um, great. Well, um, so the next question here is the preliminary planning process. Mm -hmm. Did you see any difference in how the pre construction planning plays out across these different projects? You made a, a great quote that I wrote down. Uh, so I think you kind of hinted to it um, as far as the sort of prescriptive versus performance path. Mm -hmm. uh, I really like that one. I'm going to use it. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but um, you know, what did you see in the preliminary planning that was required or how that impacts these projects? Uh, it really comes down to the individual team. Mm. For this project, you know, a fair amount of these are custom homes. Mm. Some of these are spec homes that, are, that the builder designs to sell. Um, and the, some of them, uh, in fact, four out of five projects that we do the modeling for, uh, we are asked to improve on the building for their comfort and indoor quality, as well as the energy, but they have no intention to certify. Mm -hmm. But as, uh, one in five has the goal to mm -hmm. certify from the beginning and that, you know, we take them all, uh, to the, to the entire process, you know? Mm -hmm. So the goals, uh, it's kind of the, th the, the project team that drives that conversation at any stage of the design, really. Mm. Um, yeah. And then how our input is implemented matters. Uh, you know, we make a lot of thermal comfort analysis to uh, make recommendations about which window package to use or which doors to have comfort. Uh, we provide the initial design for the ERV for the fresh air system. Mm -hmm. And those are something that mm. people that come to us want, you know, more so than the energy efficiency. Yeah. Comfort is, um, it's key. Right. And, mm. and that kind of brings me into the next question that came up, you know, people coming to you, something they want is mm -hmm. the question was for builders and contractors, are we seeing a demand in net zero from climate clients or in this case, passive house, I think we can add that in. Um, you know, where is more the pull rather than a push marking initiative, you know, client demand versus client convincing? I I think we are lucky as a mm -hmm. company, Emu. We it's like we we train people for the marathon and so they're they already are very fit. So we you know, it's also a matter of capacity. We do about 50 projects a year, something like that. So we don't do we don't do too much. Mm -hmm. Um and a lot of projects that we I would say like 60% is client driven, so owner driven, and 40% is builder driven. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, builders that come to us, their client is mm -hmm. typically more sense, um, interested in this theme. Sure. Um, and a couple of comments coming in just for clarification. People are saying maybe you can access Living Building now, you just have to fill out a form and put in some information. But, um, Okay. I don't know. It uh, that's what some people were commenting, so I wanted to put that out there. If maybe they've made some updates to their site, so <laughs> oh, that, that would be great. Yeah, I yeah. think last time I checked, it was like two fifty pair standard. Like, I don't want to pay that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe it was getting the 
hard copy mailed to you or something. But yeah, um, so some more specific technical questions. Uh, you know, getting into uh, um, the the HVAC side. So for cold climate air source heat pumps, um, there's kind of this is kind of a comment can be challenging mm -hmm. in lower temps. Uh, how was this accounted for your your analysis? Was there electrical resistance backup to maintain a fully electrified design? Um, so in life, uh, we in actual projects we have installed air source heat pumps all the way up to nine thousand feet of elevation, climate mm -hmm. zone seven plus 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 with negative twenty uh, design yeah. temperature, and so. There are good brands, brands and products for cold, actual cold mm. climate air source heat pumps. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the study, uh, we applied some uh, the, uh, reduction to the coefficient of performance by climate. Mm -hmm. So if a label uh, says, oh, for uh, like an H HSPF of 10, you know, looking at the climate data, we may have applied an HSPF of eight or something like that just we we adjusted mm. that by climate so the mm. same heat pump would perform better at uh in denver climate zone five where i'm at right now as opposed to the mountains at nine thousand feet of elevation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and did you and, and maybe you know just anecdotally speaking you know how would switching over to ground source heat pump or geothermal technology um have impacted this. And just so for those of you who don't know, there is the 30% tax credit from the Inflation Reduction Act is back for this technology. Uh, is it enough, you know, to to overcome the air source interest? I don't know. But anyway, I just curious uh, if, if that's something you consider just anecdotally what you think that would do to this. So um, I, I thought about it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in setting up a study like this, which is like, I don't know, we had 20 different states, 50 projects, you know. Yeah, yeah. I had to like take variables and like slash them down. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So so even to make it more cost comparable, we selected, we chose to use air source heat pump only. Now mm -hmm. I can give you my personal feedback on projects that we work on. Uh, and typically mm -hmm. we work on passive house or almost passive house projects mm -hmm. uh, where you know, getting that building envelope to be to that level mm -hmm. uh, provides higher thermal comfort, higher mm -hmm. durability, uh, higher indoor quality, as well as it is 70 or 80% more efficient than a condominium building. Mm -hmm. And the more efficient the building is, the less or the longer it's going to take to mm -hmm. pay back your ground source heat pumps. Mm -hmm. That's something that mm -hmm. I'm, for my own house, I am going to look at mm -hmm. uh, pricing, for the air source versus ground source because I want mm -hmm. to have a case study. Mm -hmm. But typically we don't see a lot of, the, of that. Mm -hmm. We do that, we see that in combination with the incentives. We had uh, over 200 projects that we worked on in the past 10 years, we had it like twice to have a ground source heat pump. In my opinion, that becomes very efficient when you start having a domestic hot water also generated mm -hmm. by the same heat pump. So you have you basically need more energy because mm -hmm. if, if your building is a passive house, then it's never going to pay that ground source heat pump back. You know? and, and speaking of water, um, and maybe this is in the report, but just what assumptions were made on both the water heating side and flow rates? You know, a lot of the green programs require lower flow rates. I know, you know, um, I'm not sure if passive house does or not, but where does that come into consideration? So we made an assumption that I don't remember the exact numbers uh, per uh, gallons per person. And then we had the number of people, we followed the mm. ASTA 62.2, you know, mm. number of bedrooms plus one. Mm, yep. uh, and then we assumed, we assumed an, an mm. air source uh, water heater for okay. all projects. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, because the one of the underlying assumptions was this is a, a all electric home, you know. Mm. So, uh, getting yeah. that, um, that was the assumption. Yeah. Um, in terms of the significant heat loss through the ground that you mentioned, is that mostly through the slab perimeter or through the bottom of the slab? It's mostly through the bottom of the slab to the outside. Yeah. That is something that uh, I actually have on my agenda to publish this weekend on YouTube because oh. we, do, we, we do all this modeling. We did an actual retrofit in Montana where yeah. 
they had not planned to do any insulation on in the ground and they, right. they had like a steam shower like dude that's going to be con cause condensation <laughs> you know because you know there is this con concept that the ground is at a constant temperature of 50 degrees or whatever but also the ground is very good at conducting heat you know in the mm -hmm. class mm -hmm. we ask builders and actors to compare what they think how does the ground compare in terms of heat mm -hmm. losses to insulation does it insulate more or less clearly it insulates less steel insulates more or less uh it insulates more than steel but actually dirt insulates about the same as concrete so mm -hmm. think of your house sitting mm -hmm. on a big chunk of concrete that is mm -hmm. what the heat sees you know so that is mm -hmm. the heat going from the center of your house all the way to the mm -hmm. outside it is several feet long but it does happen quite a bit yeah. actually yeah um well, and so as you mentioned, kind of in 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 final was embodied carbon, upfront carbon, embodied mm -hmm. emissions, whatever we want to call it. Um, as I mentioned, you know, right now the White House is looking for zero emissions standard. Part one is operation. Of course, they're going to get into embodied. So mm -hmm. very excited to see that coming out. And that's the direction we're headed. Uh, I know, um, you know, uh, Phi has come up with an embodied carbon calculator in their tool, which is really interesting to see mm -hmm. and exciting. You mentioned beam. Um, and so I guess just any other thoughts on where we're headed with embodied carbon? And the specific question here is, you know, when are we going to see MEP and appliances start to get applied into that? Because currently like things like beam leave it out. Um, that's a great question. I yeah. don't have an answer for that. Mm -hmm. uh, it does the switch to heat pumps make it a lot more relevant because we mm. start having refrigerants, right. um, you know, but also the, the least natural gas infrastructure we have, the least air leaks we have, mm -hmm. and methane is 20 times more, has 20 times greater potential for global warming than CO2, right. you know, so I don't know is the short answer. And I'm excited to see that also apply to um, heat pumps, uh, mm -hmm. but I don't know what what is coming next for that yeah i'm glad you mentioned gas leaks we test brand new furnaces installed and they're still leaking like crazy brand new systems it's yeah it's crazy and so if that was an embodied carbon calc i'm sure it would be pretty high so um well enrico i really appreciate you um giving us some time sticking around to answer some of these questions here um where can people go to contact you learn more again just as a reminder if they have more questions or want to follow what you're doing yeah Email is probably the best. I may be like some days or weeks late, but I do reply to email. And then uh, we have recently, as of the last few months, started to publish a lot more material on YouTube. So whenever we have some uh, modeling bits, we put that on YouTube. You know, it's a way to uh, increase awareness. You know, we have something coming up about Windows. We have something about uh, about hit losses to the ground. We always publish uh, bits from our actual projects. So I would go to the job site and look at air stealing details and I pop them on, on, on YouTube. So I think YouTube and our um, website are the best way to uh, keep in touch with us. All right. Well, I really appreciate your time and Emu as well for having you come out. And um, thank you all for joining us this week. Um, we'll catch you next week, uh, actually, for a discussion on um, embodied carbon. So really good timing for that cool. as a segue. So um, thank you so much, everyone. Take care, be well, and we'll we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you so much.